they were seeing, you know, vacancy, of course, increase, but a lot less turnover and even people moving back in. So, you know, that's the interesting thing is like anything in the marketplace, right? When it's a little too good to be true, it probably is. And, you know, I say again, the, the key metric from a developer and for those really sophisticated, you know, operators and investors, we're trying to reach a 50 to 75 basis points additional spread on the exit cap versus traditional multifamily. And really 75 is the key there. Uh, if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. My guest today on Raising Private Money has raised over $1 million in private money himself. Now, he started back in 2013 with only $95,000 in the checkbook, but now today he has a portfolio of $4.5 million in real estate. Now, in addition to that, back in 2015, he moved to San Francisco to base his new endeavor on the idea of revitalizing communities through impactful investment real estate strategies. Now, my guest is going to share with you exactly what it is that motivated him to found what is called Revive. So with over 10 years of experience in real estate and construction, my guest founded Revive to re-engineer re residential and commercial real estate in what we call underserved communities. Now, he's an expert at handling all facets of commercial transactions which include duties as a broker, as a property manager, a general contractor. And he's demonstrated a proven strong track record in commercial real estate while raising private money. And he's got a personal portfolio where he has achieved over 25% internal rate of return since he started. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Matt Ryan, right after this. Well, welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, Matt, what I discovered in my own real estate investing career and business is there was a pivotal moment in my real estate investing career that changed everything. And yep. that pivotal moment for me was I, I was from 2003 to 2009, I was relying on the local bank and mortgage companies to fund my real estate deals. And I was on the phone with my banker in January, 2009. I'd had a beautiful relationship with the bank for six years. They had been funding all my deals. I'd never heard of private money, didn't know anything about it. And I learned in January, 2009, the bank has closed my line of credit, had no way to fund my deals. That was my pivotal moment. I was able to learn about private money in a very, very short period of time. I raised $2,150,000 the first 90 days that the bank had cut me off. That was my pivotal moment because that experience has had more of an impact on my real estate investing career in 20 years versus anything else that happened. In fact, that first 12 months of being cut off from the bank. We tripled our business because I had access to private money. And you know what, Matt? If it hadn't have been for that experience of being cut off from the bank, you and I wouldn't even be visiting here today on Raising Private Money podcast without that experience. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to coach over 2,000 real estate investors on how they can raise private money and never miss out on deals for not having funding. That was my pivotal moment. What has been and what was your pivotal moment? Yeah, for me, it was, I go back to the, the first duplex, right? The first uh, true investment property. I had house hacked. I didn't know it was house hacking at the time. Up until that point, you know, 
buying a small house in Charlotte, North Carolina condo that was for short sailed and, you know, renting it out to buddies. But um, the, the duplex that I bought for, for $65,000 in up and coming neighborhood in Charlotte, you know, that was the first real estate project investment project that I had done. And then of course, through my experience with a local community member, Ms. Pam, and understanding her story and how, you know, value add investing and other forms of, you know, real estate development is pushing the Miss Pams out and given my experience in green building and sustainable construction and understanding how important it is for middle income and lower income individuals to have access to these communities that are, you know, walkable, bikeable, have, you know, transit corridors. And, you know, she walked to her, her job every morning, took the bus every night to her second shift, you know, understanding how pivotal it was for those people to have access to not only affordable housing, but well-located housing, uh, you know, that really became the genesis for Revive. And, you know, how do we revitalize these communities? How do we re-engineer them, these pockets of urban cores, you know, in a way that's conducive to all walks of life and especially the Miss Pams. And, you know, that was really the light bulb moment for me. And without in, that investment, you know, I wouldn't have had my my financial, you know, trajectory wouldn't have accelerated. And of course, you know, I wouldn't be able to connect the dots between in this, this next phase and what has, you know, inevitably become my life and my career. Did you start out investing in real estate with private money or did that come a little bit later? That just came a little bit later. Um, yeah. I, and for me, it was like everyone, you know, a lot of people start, it was family and friends money. I was actually really close to syndicating the first deal that I did that I put together under Revive's envelope. And I put it in front of a fellow syndicator who actually told me, Matt, you don't need to syndicate this. As a matter of fact, you're going to be a lot better off if you just raise this capital as private debt you know, and leverage it, you know, almost 98% at the time and, you know, stabilize it, refinance out. And he said, let me, you know, do the numbers on what I just spoke about and get back to me. I called him the next day. I was like, you know, what do I owe you? Like, <laughs> what's, what's the fee for this? He's like, just, you know, pass it along to someone else. Right. Uh, and so it was, it was really cool at that moment. I did exactly what he said. I executed on it. And of course, you know, we refinanced out and, we owned the deal outright and he had done a couple of deals that way when he was first started, you know, cause the margins were good enough. And, uh, you know, that was a really pivotal moment for us. And we continue to do that, you know, up until the last, you know, couple of years where we've really started to get more aggressive as far as raising, you know, people who aren't family and friends that we don't have a relationship and trying to build a, uh, an investor pool here at revive. So you started raising private money with family and friends and your own connections and centers yep. of influence, and then you've grown it from there. So what was it, what was it that happened in your real estate investing business that triggered you to start seeking private money? Yeah. Were you like, were you like short on cash you yeah. had the, had you maxed out with the banks i mean what was it that moved you to learn about and uh, and start raising private money yeah i mean it's the goal was to always become a syndicator and fund manager right so i kind of started with the end in mind i knew i wanted to formulate that type of business but as a lot of people you know you, and the, who have tried to do this when you're first starting out there's not a lot of limited partners, people who will really take a bet on you. You know, even at that point, I had five and a half years of construction. I've been a self-sustaining entrepreneur. I bootstrapped a company out of the ashes of the recession and construction. You know, I had, I had accomplished some things that I felt were, you know, worthy <laughs> and, you know, something that I was proud of. And, 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 you know, I'd cut my teeth as an entrepreneur. But interestingly enough, a lot of retail LPs, people who were bigger, you know, LPs that could write big checks, they were still like, listen, you know, you're a little bit early on. Um, I always joke with some of my friends is like, I feel like I have a, you know, you get done with your master's degree and, and you go out there and you try to find a job and someone says, you know what, I'm really looking for someone with a PhD, not with a master's. Um, and, and that's what it felt like. But, you know, to answer your question um, and just do a quick abbreviation, you know, we've actually raised about 2 million in equity, including my own equity that I've put down on projects and an additional 2 million. So we're to about 4 million total raised of capital on that 27% IRR. And yeah, exactly that. We just, we're starting to reach a level of critical mass where we're at 13 and a half million of assets that we're getting ready to stabilize across six different sites. And yeah, it's exactly that. Like our capital requirements, we've, we've outpunted our coverage, so to speak. Right. And um, as much as you enjoy those, you know, easy ki kind of relationships with family and friends, you know, we wanted to move on and take on outside LP interest because you also need that interest 
to be able to keep the lights on as a syndicator, right? You have to do deals, unfortunately, and accumulate some fees to be able to uh, cover your overhead. And unfortunately, because a lot of the deals that we go into in-house that even when we restructure with private debt, um, you know, it's not enough to kind of keep the lights on. And a lot of those deals are still long-term deals that a lot of our equity is locked up and so on and so forth. And so we found a great balance uh, in doing that. But yeah, I mean, that's at the end of the day, it was always part of our business strategy and part of our business model. And at this point, if we're going to continue to grow and scale from, you know, the next hundred million and, you know, hit our next round of objectives, inevitably, we're going to have to do that with outside capital. Absolutely. Um, as you've been raising, what year did you start raising private money, uh, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I tinkered around with it initially, and I wasn't very successful at it. So, I mean, actively, you know, we tested the market four or five years ago. We pulled back, and I think we've really put our head down and really started to get aggressive again, probably in the last year or two, where we're, we're you know, spending a lot of money on content. We're spending a lot of time on paid ads. You know, we're really being aggressive at it. So I would say in the last, you know, call it 12 to 18 months is when we really started to put our head down and get aggressive again. Um, and yeah. Matt, you just said something very interesting. And based on what you said and what you're getting ready to say, our listeners can really learn something very important from your experience. You said just a moment ago that when you started out raising private money, you weren't very successful at it. So with that being the case, and by the way, welcome to the club. With that being the case, um, what mistake or mistakes did you make as you first started out raising private money? Yeah. And if you knew today, I mean, if you knew then what you do know today about private money, what would you go back and do differently? What were those mistakes and lessons learned? Yeah, always a lot to unpack there, right? Uh, I mean, for, for me, it was you know, everyone says, get a deal and you'll find the money. And I, just, <laughs> I think that's such, right? You laugh, right? But it's still just like constantly reiterated. And I see it all the time on Facebook groups. And it's like, I got a deal. And so I kind of, I put a lot of time in operationally being good at sourcing deals and getting sexy deals, off-market deals. We were sourcing 50% of our deals off-market at one point, doing this all in-house, burning a lot of capital and, and not just money, but our own turn, internal time trying to source direct you know, deals, compete against brokers, right? Um, and realizing that's a David Goliath, like us being David, right? They have you know, six brokers covering what, what just me and a small team of people. And so that was the biggest mistake because you get those deals, you, know, you get those opportunities, and then you start trying to, to run around and raise money with people that you really don't have established relationships with. And you're like, wow, like we fell completely flat on her face. It didn't work out. And so Matt, you know, Matt, 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 I am so glad you are sharing <laughs> your real life experience Yeah, because I'm sick and tired of the gurus yeah, totally. out there preaching and teaching, get the deal under contract. The money will show up. I want to throw up I know. if I hear that one more time. I it's know, like, I know. It's like, where? Where, where, where is yeah. the money going to show up, right? Where is yeah. it going to show up? Yeah, because exactly, like, you, you you know, if you're writing, especially out here, ultra competitive deals, sometimes we were putting deals, we were, you know, we were doing smaller deals. We were trying to scale co-living. So we were making offers on deals where we didn't have a contingency. In. We didn't have an inspection period because these were like single family homes that we were going to gut and completely reno. And so it's like, how do you raise capital for a deal? You had to have soft commits. You had to have the money ready. So, you know, that, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And so for us, it was like, you know, everyone wants to be a syndicator, but the time, the thing of it is, is you have to realize there's really a point in time where you reach that level of critical mass. And I, I don't know what it is for most people. You got to put your 10,000 hours in, you have to really build trust amongst people and you have to have a unique product, you know, value add is a low barrier of entry. But it created a very crowded marketplace for a long period of time. We actually got out of value add deals because everybody was trying to do it and everyone was paying ridiculous prices. So for the co-living product, when we pivoted to that, it was like, okay, we found a nice little interesting niche and it set us back because it was a new product and it's still a new idea. And you know, it's still been difficult to raise money around. But now as it the industry is reaching a level of critical mass and reputation. And you, you find those early stage investors who are used to taking 
a little bit more riskier gambles to get, you know, absorb, you know, to get a bite of the market early and finding that right person now, all of a sudden. So, you know, to kind of get to your second part of your question, you know, it's, it just takes time and it takes just a, you know, a complete grinding effort of failure and just trying everything. If I had to go back, you know, what would I do differently? Frankly, I would have invested passively with a few syndicators and fund managers with some of the capital that I had. And I would have made money while learning from them and probably got introduced to some other LPs, right? And then spawn off and said, hey, I got a deal. Are you interested? I, that would have been one way. The second way I would have done it is I would have picked one marketing median, you know, whether it's outbound LinkedIn or Facebook ads. And I would have just committed to that for a year or two. You know what I mean? And really stuck with it and found one way. In my I've grown my syndication company with little to no partners. So I've never had that kind of structural outlay where I could just focus on one thing. I've had to really be the jack of all trades. So I've had a lot of limited time and energy to go to networking events. You know, I really had to get a good bang for my buck and how I'm creating an inbound volume of potential retail investors. You know, people are going to invest thirty-five to $250,000. And that was always a part of my thesis. I wanted to make our deals accessible to small investors because I believe in that, but that's also inherently difficult. A lot of syndicators start out by finding, we call them whales in the industry, right? Someone who can stroke a 500 to a million dollar check or more, and they're going to get a bigger cut you know, of the GP or the waterfall or whatever. And then those guys reach scale with those people relatively quickly. And that's an avenue people can take if you have those contacts, right? And so that's the thing I think it's really, you know, it's, it's difficult to manage is you, you got to pick a strategy and you got to really stick with that strategy because you're going to fail for six to nine months and before you're going to finally hit the bell curve and you won't even know when it's coming. Right. And, and that's the I think that's where in capital raising, be ready to fail for almost 12 months before you even reach a point. And that's just anecdotally my story. You know, it may take other people longer. And I would say the, the kind of the two part, second part to that you know, second question is you really have to focus on communicating why you are different. Everyone's doing a value add deal, right? Everyone's, you know, everyone's getting at this low barrier of entry. We're going to take a C apartment. We're going to kick these people out. We're going to double rents. Why are you different? What makes your deal and why should I invest with you with the other guys who are on crowd street, who have 20 years experience, billion AUM, they got the nice ties. They got the, you know, 30 people on staff. You're a small guy trying to do your first two or three deals. Why? Why should I do business with you? And it's interesting because you get asked that question by some rather aggressive, you know, frank retail investors initially. And you kind of, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and you kind of get hit with it. And, and you know, you, you don't find yourself getting hit with that question unless you've answered it for yourself. And work on your communication strategy as to what your niche is and how you're going to drive that home. And it damn well better not be the same story that you hear on crowd street and everything else. And so you got to find something different. And for us, once we, once we found the co-living product, you know, in revive in its thesis, it's broader thesis of a company, we have a very unique strategy. The problem is we couldn't scale that given the size and the company of who we were today. So we had to pick one product that was early in the marketplace that we believed in that fit the broader thesis of who we are as a company and we had to drive that home. In the tech world, they call it the MVP, the minimal viable product, right? What is the thing that gives you your competitive edge that you're going to drive to the moon? And for us, once we found it, everything kind of became a little bit easier. Now, it's not easy. We're still, you know, just going through the, the you know, the drudgery of trying to raise capital and build a network and an audience. Um, but gosh, where we are today where, versus where we were three to four years ago, it, it feels like, you know, night and day. So... Matt, let's give everybody a gift for hanging in with us here so far on the show. If you are a real estate investor and you're struggling to raise private money to have funding for your deals, or are you a seasoned real estate investor and you just want more funding for your deals? Well, I'm so excited about the new private money guide, seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your business and help you build incredible wealth. You can download this guide to get you on the fast track to private money for free at jayconner, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash money guide. 
That's www.jayconner.com forward slash money guide to get on the fast track to getting all the private money you would want for your deals. You know, Matt, uh, as we were talking a moment ago, I'm just I'm just sick and tired of people saying, um, you know, get the deal on the contract. The money will show up. I've also heard them say the money follows the deals wrong. Right. The deal, the money comes first. Right. And then the deals follow the money. I mean, it's like the worst time I know you tell me, Matt, the worst time I know to be raising private money is when you need it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you, there, there's, there's this really interesting thing where you kind of smell of desperation and no one likes to deal with desperation, right? People want people who are like, I don't really need your money, but I'll take you in, right? Like that's the that's the biggest mind trick you can always play with a potential investor. It's like, yeah, you know, I don't really need this money, but if you're willing to come in the deal. And yeah, I mean, it's, and the thing of it is, is there's different types of capital structures, right? And for us, we never wanted to, we never wanted to give up more you know what I mean? Because when you're starting and you're trying to build a company, you really need more of those act fees to survive, right? The waterfall's great, but you need the upfront to keep, like I said, to keep the lights on. It's like a big struggle for syndicators. And, you know, people who are going to take a big sizable chunk of that upfront fee, you know, when you get into that type of capital, what's really going to happen is you're going to give up more than what you should. And frankly, you're going to get someone who isn't buying into this long-term relationship with you. And everyone talks about relationships, relationships in the, in the industry. And well, what does that mean? It's to me, it's someone who believes in the thesis of you and your team and the product that you're investing in. And that's not something that you create by IRR and cash on cash and a fancy pitch deck. It's really getting into the droves and the trenches of understanding this is the 10 years of, of runway that we're going after, right? And, and once you do that, it takes a lot more time up front, but the dividends pay because you're not having to go in and recreate the wheel, right? You're not just doing a deal and then having to go find a next partner who's kind of sharking you and taking advantage of you because they can. You're, you, it's someone who believes in you and your team and your product. And it's just really that, I mean, it is that simple. Of course, the process is not that simple because as you said, there's a lot of misconceptions and everyone wants to believe that raising capital is easy and everyone wants to throw out this high IR deal um, you know, and I think it lends itself to a lot of risk because, and I tell people, any retail investor, I'm like, if you expect me to get your attention with a fancy IRR or ROI, guess what? It's not going to happen. We, we shoot for middle of the fairway returns on our pro forma basis. I will walk you through how we're, I think we're going to outperform and why I think we're going to outperform, but I'm not going to sell you on high IRR. You know, I don't want those investors coming into me. Those aren't the type of people that I want to partner with on deals, um, you know, and, and that's it's hard. Right. I put myself at a disadvantage from day one, but I want the long term relationships. I want the people who are going to be like, you didn't get me a 22 percent. I want the people who are going to be like, man, you really outperformed on this deal. You kind of underperformed in the you know, or, or you underperformed a little bit. But the last two, you've really outperformed. And I, I still believe in you as a firm in your thesis. Right. And, and I mean, those are the relationships you got to build and you just have to be patient. And I think it's hard in today's world where everyone wants critical mass and scale. And, you know, those things are rewarded. The overnight success, success is rewarded, you know, but the long term tenure player is kind of looked at the, the tortoise. Right. And I, I think it's really difficult in our space and in our world. But, um, you know, for me, it's been it's been good and it's been beneficial. And I've, I've built a great real estate portfolio and. You know, I don't have to raise retail LP. I don't have to go to 100 million. I could stay where I'm at right now. I mean, frankly, I can retire off the income just stabilizing these properties. But I believe in my product and I believe in building this idea. And so for me, it's it's a it's, it's a critical step. But um, you know, for anyone else, you, you could you know, if you want to retire at 35 or 40, it, it's a possibility, certainly. You know, um, or have enough income where you could feel comfortable. So. Matt, you just mentioned uh, ROI, return on investment. You just mentioned IRR, which stands for internal rate of return. I want you to define what's the difference between return on investment and IRR, internal rate of return. But before you do, mm -hmm. I want to make sure everybody understands that um, your company, uh, Revive, has an opportunity 
you have investors, uh, you're looking to establish new relationships with investors that are just looking for passive high rates of return safely and securely. I want you to tell people about Revive. You've been talking about your mission. You've been talking about your thesis. So I want you to tell our audience about that. But before you do, um, what's the difference uh, from their perspective between a return on investment, ROI, and an internal rate of return, IRR? Yeah, uh, when you do a regular return on investment calculation, you're not taking into consideration what they call the time value of money. So the internal rate of return, um, it can get very, very complicated. But essentially what it does is it does exactly that. It takes into consideration the fact that money erodes over time, right? So we have high interest rate, or excuse me, high inflation right now. So money is eroding. So internal rate of return compensates for that in its calculation. And there's three different ways that you can do it in Excel. Uh, it's very basic functionality, frankly. And it's really important to understand those different methodologies because if you just say, hey, I've got a 22% ROI, that's great. But if that's over, say, a 10-year time frame and you're starting to incorporate a, a, a you know inflationary rate or a discounted reinvestment rate of zero, your IRR may be much lower than that. So when you're benchmarking one deal or one investment versus the other, we use internal rate of return more commonly in the financial investment space because it's taken into consideration, again, that, that, that money erodes over time. And that a lot of longer deals, seven to 10 year deals, you know, if you're doing an opportunity zone deal, you'll see lower IRRs simply because of that fact. You know, there's an old saying, that, you know, time is the enemy of IRR, right? Um, and so that's just an important distinction. It's, it, it's kind of simple, but it can be fairly complicated, you know, from a mathematical perspective. Sure. So you've been talking about your company, Revive. We heard the story about Miss Pam, yeah. who was, you know, motivated you to do what you are doing. So unpack for us. What is Revive? What does Revive do? Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's your long term vision for Revive? Uh, what's the opportunity fund zone? Um, yeah. Why would someone want to get involved with doing business with you and being a passive investor? Yeah, I, so I'll take it forward to the, the microcosm of what we're focusing on right now, which is co-living. And the reason we liked co-living, which is a rent-to-bedroom strategy aimed at 22 to 35-year-olds, is that, you know, for one, we're delivering basically a class A, B-plus product at the bottom 15% of the rental market. So the average studio in Sacramento and Denver is probably renting for $1,650, upwards close to $2,000. We're offering a bedroom with a shared common furnished amenities for $1,200, not including utilities. So $1,250 inclusive utilities, roughly speaking. So there's a pretty significant cost difference there, right? And, and affordability for this younger 22 to 35 demographic in major urban areas like Denver and Sacramento, where the jobs, the high paying jobs are. It's a really big issue. A lot of these people are spending over upwards of 40% of their income. Affordability is a, is a major issue, not just for that demographic, but other demographics like the Miss Pants, right? And the reason we like the co-living product is not only because it tailors to that audience, but we also see you know, something happening in the real estate space where these younger individuals are flocking to these up and coming neighborhoods, you know, these middle to lower middle income neighborhoods because the housing stock is inevitably affordable where the Miss Pams live. But then there's the, you know, older um, tenants, community members who are thus getting pushed out because those two groups are competing for one another for this type of housing, which is typically low density, a single family home, a do, tri, quadplex, maybe a 10 unit building. And what's happening in these neighborhoods is we're not able to deliver product fast enough, mainly because of the regulatory barriers that have been put in place by building departments and planning departments across the country. And so what we like about co-living is that we feel like we can rapidly deliver product to this demographic and it takes the pressure off the competition between these younger individuals who are just seeking an affordable place to live and the Miss Pams of the world who are just seeking to stay in their neighborhood and maintain their affordable rent. Taking that a step further, Revive's thesis is to take a community-based approach to investment. So a non-asset specific, but area specific approach. And it, it it piggybacks on this larger idea where I, I can't, you know, had this idea for my neighborhood that I was invested in where I bought my duplex as to how we were going to revitalize that neighborhood and focus not just on providing market rate housing, but affordable housing. 
and looking outside the box of affordable housing and traditional means of providing affordable housing. Because a lot of what's happening in the affordable housing world is we have basically a, a redistribute tax and redistribution model. And it's not easy for a small scale developer or boutique developer to offer affordable housing, uh, especially here in the Bay. You have to work for a large institutional nonprofit. You have to wait several years to get your projects approved. You have to put these complex tax structures. And so at the, th at the very you know, core of who we are at Revive is we want to become innovators in the housing space to tackle these issues, because really what we see is that these middle income to lower income people are getting pushed further and further outside the opportunities. You know, these high paying job cores, the majority of, the, of uh, jobs are being produced in major urban cores. Uh, Brookings Institute coming out of last recession, 75% of the jobs were produced in markets of over a million dollars or a million people. You know, so this isn't a trend that's going to slow down even in the post COVID era. And so what's happening is, is people are getting pushed further and further outside the cities. They're being subjected to commutes, super commutes. And, you know, even as we build transportation infrastructure, these people are just being starved of opportunity and young people included. And we see suburban sprawl and especially the ex-urban sprawl um, really as, you know, a negative, a net negative to our society. And, uh, we, you know, we see these, especially to steal a term from John Burns, these kind of suburban arteries, you know, these neighborhoods that are, that are kind of uh, gentrifying and revitalizing as kind of the core opportunity for real estate investment in the next coming decades. And so we're trying to tie all that together in a model that is innovative and, you know, finds a balance between both those, those interests. And that was really the, um, you know, again, the, the core and kind of thesis of Revive. That's really interesting, Matt. Um, I've got a couple more really, really important questions for you. But before I ask those questions, um, go ahead and share how our listeners and viewers can get in touch with you and learn more about how they can invest with you and get good rates of return safely and securely. Yeah, absolutely. Just go to revive.com uh, on the homepage there. You can take a look at our current deal that we have open for a few select investors. That's our deal in Sacramento. And then there's also a, a handy little link there. You can schedule a time. Uh, my assistant will reach out to you to just get a little bit of information about you know, the context of the conversation, what you'd like to talk about, and then you can speak with me directly and we can talk more about, you know, not only the existing opportunities that we have open, but the opportunities that we'll also be pursuing in the co-living space and, and get familiar with that product and, you know, hopefully buy into what, what we're looking at is and what we see as a, one of the biggest opportunities in the multifamily space. And for everyone that's listening, revive.com is not spelled the way you may think. So be sure and take note of this. We will have this in the show notes. You can scroll down and see it. But the website for Revive.com is www.re-viv.com. Again, that's www.re-viv.com. Matt, uh, what's the minimum investment? 35K right now. 35K. Okay, very low entry point. I've got a lot of private lenders myself. I've got 47 private lenders investing in our deals right now. Um, so this, this concept of co-living, that is someone being able to rent a room, mm -hmm. having a common furnished area. Um, is any of your co-living um, offered in single family houses or all of them um, multiplexes? Yeah, all of them are pretty much multiplexes. Interestingly enough, the two deals that we're doing in Denver and Sacramento were historically single family homes that were then converted into commercial offices and will be converting back into residential. And, um, you know, tr boarding houses is kind of how they've traditionally been set up. We tend to try to break them up. So we have nowhere between four to maybe five, even sometimes six people sharing a common space, depending on the existing layout. Now, a lot of what most co-living operators are doing is they're doing ground up development specific for mm -hmm. co-living. For these existing assets, you have a little bit less options available to because you're converting an existing building. But um, that's that's typically how it's kind of fractionalized off uh, and how it's set up. So, you know, for a real estate investor or a passive investor that might want to get involved, um, there's some very common questions that I'd like for you to answer. Sure. Uh, for people that have never been exposed to how this co-living thing works. Number one. How do you decide who qualifies to be a co-living tenant 
What kind mm-hmm. of background check do you do? How? What's the approval process? Um, and and I'll just rattle off all the questions, and you already know what they are, and then you can just go for it. So, how do they qualify? Uh, what kind of deposit is required? Um, how do you? How do they lock their door and keep their stuff private? Yeah. Um, how do they, you know? How how do how do you? manage people getting along with other people in this co-living environment how often do they pay rent who manages it how often do you go in there and make sure that the whole place isn't torn apart you know like how does all those logistics work yeah starting with the tenant screening process it's very similar to how you would vet someone for a multifamily building with the exception you know so you have background checks you have one month's deposit uh you know income verification, the exception being that once you have, say, a couple interested candidates who are serious about actually renting the room, you then set up interviews or screening with the existing tenants. And that's where fit actually matters in the co-living space, right? Like you want to make sure that the individuals that you're bringing in are going to jive with the existing tenants that are there. And while there's some democratization to that process as an owner, right, you can't constantly be at the whims of the existing tenants. So you do your best and operators do their best to give everyone a voice and an opportunity to, you know, raise any concerns that they may have. And so that way they feel engaged in the process because this person is going to be sharing amenity space with them. You're looking for red flags, right? And that's how it's been traditionally run. You know, the thing about the operating models that's been around for many, many years, especially in Europe, you're seeing tech platforms being, you know, started in, in European countries that are making the pairing and matchmaking process even more simplified and frictionless for the prospective tenants. And then from a management perspective, the nice thing about co-living is you're typically having someone who's on site, who's kind of running like a team lead for that individual dwelling unit or building, depending on the size and scale. And, you know, the majority of the operators that we're looking to pair with are experienced co-living operators. So they understand the ins and outs of this product. They've been, you know, compensated structurally in a way that, you know, allows for them to make up for that extra time, energy effort that they're utilizing to not only maintain the common areas, but to also place the tenants. And therefore, you know, they understand the nuances of it. And, uh, you know, at at the end of the day, again, like I said, it's a, it's a business model that's been operating for decades, you know, not years now. And uh, it's continually even getting more sophisticated and frictionless for prospective tenants. And, um, you know, at a point in time where, Operators are getting even better and better and offering amenities and commu- ways to keeping people engaged in community life activities, dinners, so on and so forth, and providing additional amenities. You mentioned that <clears throat> for the tenant, it's a lot more affordable. So instead of renting an entire household, yeah. you're renting a room with com- As far as the operator goes or the owner of that asset, what would you say on average is a multiple of, say, just straight rent that they could, if they were like renting out the entire uh, property versus a room at the time? As in like what's kind of the premium that we get relative to, say, multifamily? Right. So let's say, for example, you um, in the um, example you gave, if someone was renting for $2,200 a month, they're going to be able to rent a room for, say, $1,250 a month. Yeah. So you as the operator, how much more income are you going to be able to get, assuming full occupancy, which you're not going to have 100% occupancy all the time, right. but assuming 100% occupancy, how much more rent can you bring in versus just renting the whole thing out? Yeah. Be- this is completely anecdotal and and, and kind of, also within the context of bringing together a lot of analysis of existing property managers and conversations amongst other developers, we've seen anywhere between a 15 to 35% net operating premium um, based on traditional multifamily. So if you were to compare the same building and you were to just lease it up as studios, one bedrooms, you know, two, three bedroom, which is your typical unit, you know, unit matrix on a multifamily development, we're seeing those numbers. On a rent per square foot basis, right, like gross rents or net collected rents, I mean, we've seen really substantial, like almost double the amount of rent on a per square foot basis. Um, We've seen some really high numbers. It all kind of depends on what your square foot makeup is, 
And that's the thing is those guys who were getting, say, double on a rent per square foot basis and on paper their NOI looked, you know, 45 to 55 percent higher. Well, they were really small rooms. So when COVID hit, all of a sudden they were facing, you know, massive, massive vacancy, whereas some of the co-living spaces that were, you know, in that 25 to 35 percent kind of sweet spot, but had a little bit more space, they were seeing, you know, vacancy, of course, increase, but a lot less turnover and even people moving back in. So, you know, that's the interesting thing is like anything in the marketplace, right? When it's a little too good to be true, it probably is. And, you know, I say again, that the key metric from a developer and for those really sophisticated, you know, operators and investors, we're trying to reach a 50 to 75 basis points additional spread on the exit cap versus traditional multifamily. And really 75 is the key there. Um, that's kind of what we're trying, that, that's essentially what we're trying to hit. In addition to, again, a premium on NOI and a premium on net rent, you know, obviously net rent, gross rents is a little bit, you know, we're a little bit less concerned about that mm-hmm. because it's higher up on the, on the uh, balance or excuse me, the income statement, right? Well, your business model reminds me of what my marketing mentor told me years ago. He said, Jay, no matter what you're selling, Buy it by the gallon and sell it by the squirt. <laughs> so, so you're not renting out households. You're renting out rooms. You're selling it by the squirt. So I love it. Matt, what an enlightening show and enlightening guest you've been. Thank you so much for joining me. And one more time to connect with Matt, talk with him personally, and talk about the opportunity of investing with him and getting a Really, really high rate of return safely and securely. You can locate Matt Ryan at www.re-viv.com, revive.com. And that'll be down in the show notes as well. Matt, thank you so much. My pleasure, Jay. Thanks so much for having me. You got it. And there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, the Private Money Authority. And we need your help in order us to continue to have amazing guests such as Matt Ryan that we had today. We need you to help us share, like, follow, subscribe, all the above. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and tap that bell so you don't miss out on notifications. If you happen to be listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow us so you don't miss out as well. Looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money.